You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany. And welcome back to The Social Workers live radio talk show here on WCDB Albany. My name is Eric Hardiman. I'm your co-host here with Alyssa Lotmore. Welcome back, Alyssa. Hey, Eric. I'm really excited because this is our last show of the spring semester, and we have a really great guest. So... <laughs> We do indeed. We have Sherry Saturno with us by telephone. Let's just check real quick. Sherry, can you hear us? Good morning. Yes, I can. Great. We can hear you, and you're going live over the air, and we finally have success with our technical difficulties here in the studio. (laughs) Thank you for bearing with us. So Sherry Saturno is a national award-winning social worker and duly licensed as a nursing home administrator and clinical social worker. She holds master's degrees from Columbia and Long Island universities. Sherry is a Stanford-certified project manager and completed a national postgraduate fellowship at New York University. University's Silver School of Social Work. She previously wrote and produced a nationally a national award-winning documentary short film called Human Investment and has been published in both Social Worker Today and the New Social Worker magazines. Sherry, welcome to the Social Workers Radio Show. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be speaking with you. Well, Sherry, I did see your uh, your documentary uh, the, uh, called Human Investment. I did see that. And I know you also did a TED Talk. So I want to start off with the TED Talk that you did and sort of give our, our, our audience a sort of a recap of what it was that you talked about and what inspired you to go on do a TED Talk. Sure. Well, I, I was I was very honored to have the opportunity to do a TED Talk, and my talk was called Use Your Broken Heart to Find Your Greatness. And um, over the past couple of years, I've been reading and watching accounts on the news of young people who've been struggling with being bullied, and even some accounts of young people who would kill themselves because they've been bullied. And every time I heard about another account or read about it, it affected me very deeply. And I thought about it, and I really wanted to do something to help someone who was going through what I had actually experienced myself when I was younger. Uh, when, I was, when I was a child and when I was young, I was bullied for many years. And I started to think about it. And I thought about how, you know, there's a lot of good in the world that victims may not be able to recognize because of their present circumstances, and that can possibly lead to a tragedy. And I thought about how those feelings of isolation and hopelessness can be overwhelming. And I thought if someone watched my talk, it might make that person feel less alone because bullying is really a terribly isolating experience and one that can carry a lot of shame. I know, and when I, when I watched your TED Talk, you really did. You talked about your own experience, which is a way to connect to people who may be going through the same thing. Have you gotten any feedback from individuals who listened to it or who, I mean, I was deeply moved by it, and I thought it was really empowering. Have, has, have you gotten any feedback from other individuals? Actually, I, I did, and I was, that was really the entire goal of doing that talk, and uh, you know, thank you so much for, t- for taking the time to listen and to watch it. Um, I did get contacted by several individuals who said that they had been bullied when they were young. It really brought a lot of memories back to them, and, uh, but, but in a good way. It, it made them feel as though uh, you know, there was something positive at the end of that. And I also uh, corresponded with the um, National Bullying Prevention Center, hmm. and they viewed the talk, and they thought that it might be something that could help someone else, so they decided to run it on their website. And from from that perspective, other people, um, young, younger people, are having the opportunity to watch it and hopefully, you know, connect in some way. Um, if, they, if it resonates with them in some way, that was the entire goal of doing that. I know there's been a lot of attention nationally uh, in the past couple of years, but certainly, you know, even more recently about bullying and about suicide. And I know uh, in the past, some of those topics related to those issues have been societally taboo, um, but they, it seems like they're getting a little more traction in terms of conversation. And I wonder if you have some thoughts about that and sort of how and why that might be changing. Absolutely. I, mean, I, I can tell you when I was young that the term bullying really didn't even... Um the, the way that you hear it now, it really didn't even exist at that point in time. Mm-hmm. It was really just a rite of passage. Um, you know, there was always someone who was, uh, you know, being isolated or left out of things. 
But what I've noticed now, uh, you know, in this age of social media, that the bullying is taking on so many different shapes and forms where it used to be where you would go to school or you would ride a school bus and, and or you would be in a cafeteria and that's where the bullying would occur. But now it's occurring online. Now it's occurring um, where mm-hmm. even if a young person or a teenager is going home and they're trying to escape it, they really can't. If they look at their phone and they, and they see what's happening, someone's posting something about themselves. I think that it's it's gaining more attention now because we're so interconnected and we're in some ways hyperconnected where it's almost as though even when you're trying to uh, take some time for yourself, people are always looking at their phones, always monitoring their social media, and I think that plays a role in it as well. And I think it comes in so many different ways, shapes, and forms. I mean, it's not just always somebody posting something about somebody. I mean, there could be even if, if an individual who's the you know the victim, let's say, isn't even on social media, there could still be stuff going on and being said about them that when they come to school the next day, everyone knows and or is laughing at them or knows about something. And there really is, even if you know, oh, remove social media or I'm not on social media, it doesn't mean that there isn't types of bullying that even the victim might not know about that's going on about them, which is sort of a a scary thing, too. That's absolutely, that's exactly right. And there's no way at this point, um, you know, it's unrealistic to think that social media isn't going to permeate and and really be part of the conversation. Mm. And what do you think is the, you know, we may be straying a little bit from our original conversation slightly, so, you know, steer us back in if we do, but uh, what do you think is the role of the school schools and particularly, you know, sort of um, elementary, middle schools and high schools in dealing with this? Uh, You know, that is, that's a very complex question. I know that most schools have, for example, school social workers. Um, I have a a wonderful friend who's a school social worker um, and will get called in when there is a child or a young person who's experiencing a difficult time. I know that schools have clinical psychologists on staff, but it's it's difficult to say what the role would be. Um, I believe that the role would be one to try to create an environment that is conducive to learning, that's supportive, that supports people who are different, and actually celebrates diversity. Um, how do you do that? I think it's through education. I mm. think it's through supportive counseling. I think it's by involving friends and family members in the community in general. So I think that it's it's complex and that it involves more than just one person, and that it. To do it right, it would take um, time and effort. And I, I totally agree because I used to work. I used to work in um, elementary and middle school as a school social worker, and I really think that that culture piece is a, a critical component because I can work individually with students, um, the students who are being bullied, the students who are bullying, but if there's an overall culture where this is just how we talk to each other, this is just what we do, this is just what's expected, it's really hard to break that even if I'm working with you know one individual, if it's going on in the class and that's just how things are done in that sense. Um, the culture is that critical piece of how do we change that school culture. Absolutely. I agree with that. And and I'm I'm curious about, you know, maybe if you could tell us a little bit, Sherry, you know, if you've just tuned in, if you're listening and you just tuned in, I just want to remind everyone that you're listening to WCDB Albany, and this is the Social Workers Live Radio Talk Show. With us, we have Sherry Soterno, who's a social worker. And uh, Sherry is talking to us right now specifically about bullying and uh, some of the related topics. And so, Sherry, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about sort of what got you into social work and your own journey into the social work profession and sort of how maybe um, once you became a social worker, you've gotten interested in these particular issues? Sure. Well, I I think that since I was young, I always was interested in what could I do to make a difference. And I was interested in what I could do to make a difference in someone's life. I started to think about what type of professions would lead me into that. And I became very interested in studying social work. Um, I wanted to be able to work with um, clients who were struggling in some way. Um, Throughout my career, I've had the opportunity to work with younger people, with people who are struggling with mental illness, um, people at the end of their life who are perhaps on hospice or palliative and end-of-life care. And I really wanted to focus on um, something that had some type of personal meaning, um, something that I felt as though I was accomplishing something on a more personal level. And uh, that drew me to the field of social work and um, to study at Columbia. 
And uh, at that point, I was very exposed and immersed to an enormous amount of different um, scholars that I was learning from, educators. Uh, living in New York City, it really opened my eyes and it provided a, a vibrant learning community. No, I just have a question. I mean, you've worked with a lot of different stages of life and, you know, bullying and just the rejection, I guess, is not something that just ends when you leave middle school. I mean, no. going on even social media today, there's adults who are making comments. You know, it's just when you see just this overall tone of I can say whatever I want to say, I can, you know, insult people, I can make people feel bad and bring them down. What advice do, can you give someone, you know, no matter where they are in their life uh, about how to deal with rejection? and channel it into something positive because it's something I think that all people, uh, no matter what age they are, can experience and go through at a certain level. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. There's, there's no age limit. Um, what I would say is that you have to start to think about viewing adversity as a source of opportunity because you may be contending with bullies you know, from the time that you're a child up until the time that you're a senior because... Um, it absolutely doesn't end, just as you said, when you're in middle school. I think that uh, my goal would be to convey a message of hope and strength that even if you are going through a difficult time, that things will get better and not to give up. I would say to someone who is struggling that you have to learn how to believe in your own self-worth and tune out the negativity that may surround you. Um, it's a lot to do with perseverance. It's a lot to do about how you consider rejection. I do believe that rejection is just part of life. Um, it will test your character, but you will learn more from rejection than you ever will from success. And if you start to use it as your fuel, um, you know, use it to chase your dreams, your happiness, your goals. Don't let the people who judge you win. Um, if you think about your story, whatever the source of your struggle is, consider that to actually be your power. And by looking into whatever is causing you this pain, whatever your hardship is, that's actually where you can find the greatest amount of strength that you have. And I, I imagine it's something that you can't always do on your, by yourself. That support system must be a critical component in dealing with rejection and helping you get to that level where you can sort of have this a message, you know, feel hopeful and feel positive about the future. I'm, I'm assuming that's a support system to get you to that point is a critical component. I really do believe that it is. Um, I think that... You don't necessarily have to have a large group of friends or a, a large support network, but I think that you can make it through if you have at least one person who's there for you. Um, I think that a lot of times with bullying and dealing with rejection, people turn away from it. Um, they feel shame. They feel fear. And then they really silence that very narrative that's the foundation of their strength. But I think that if a child is in school and is being bullied or as, a, as an older adult, if you just have one person, one friend, um, someone in your community that you can turn to who believes in you, I really believe that can make all the difference. Hmm. And I think especially with the, I mean, we talk about so many of the negatives with social media in terms of, you know, being able to bully, being able to um, just have this sort of, you know, negative comments on photos and, you know, not liking p uh, pictures, so isolation in some types of ways. But there probably is also a lot of positive support networks that could be available online, um, being able to reach, you know, your TED Talk and just different things that uh, individuals can use and resources online. Do you have any uh, resources or, I, I'm not sure, I'm sort of putting you on the spot here, but are there any resources that stu you know, students or individuals can find that can help them through this process? Absolutely. Well, one that comes to mind is the National Bullying Prevention Center. So if there is a student who is being bullied, is having a very difficult time, they can go online, they can call the National Bullying Prevention Center. Um, there are videos online um, that are posted there, people talking about their personal experiences and a list of resources. They could also contact, I know this is very difficult, but if someone is in a very precarious situation, they could turn to their school social worker, uh, their school psychologist psychologist, someone who's trusted in the community, um, someone that they feel safe with, and, you know, explain to them what's going on. Uh, sometimes I think that can make the difference in terms of averting, um, you know, a tragic circumstances. So if there's someone that they feel comfortable with, I would encourage that person to turn to that individual. Yeah. 
I'd like to switch gears just for a second and talk a little bit about your documentary. Because, uh, I would love to know. A li- I watched. I watched it, but I, you know, I'm not sure if my co-host had the chance uh, to watch it yet. But can you just talk a little bit about the your documentary that you created? Sort of why, you, what it was about, and why you created it. Sure. Um, well, it, it was called Human Investment, and it was actually filmed all in one day in about eight hours at Binghamton University, and um, it was. It was created in part to try to shine a light on professionals and what inspires them to help others. So in the film, you'll actually see social workers, uh, nurses, educators, professors, and they all have a common theme. And the theme is that they got into their professions because they were curious about what they could do to make a difference in someone's life. So I was thinking about, you'll hear so much about capital investment or... Mm -hmm. Uh, people who work in finance, and they'll talk about putting in, um, you know, financial investments in making a company grow. So I started to think about human investment. What drives these people to actually invest themselves, their education, their professional careers in helping others? And I thought it would be interesting because I didn't really see that theme being explored so much of, it's, it's not so much about the clients, it's about the professionals who serve them and what had prompted them to get into these types of careers. Great. So, so tell us, uh, you know, wh- where has the film been shown, and how do you uh, how do you get this to people? How do you get the film to an audience? Sure. So the film has been shown at um, Binghamton University. Mm-hmm. It's been shown at the National Association of Social Workers uh, State Conference in New York um, last year. I believe it was last October, and it's also been shown at um, other schools of social work. Uh, you know, as part of a learning tool. Anyone who'd like to watch the film, it's actually on YouTube, and it's oh. it's available there. So anyone could watch it if they just look up Human Investment. And I'm actually working on, uh, starting this year, a new short film project. And this project is about social workers, but it's talking about dispelling the myths that media may have about the role of the social work and public misperceptions about social workers. Great. One of the things that Alyssa and I talk about frequently is uh, how social workers find their own voice and how they use media and particularly new and developing um, realms of media and technology to to use that voice. And so, it's, so in essence, kind of how does the social work profession, but also individual social workers within it, um, move beyond sort of traditional ways of messaging and, and look toward um, new media. And, and it sounds like you've found a couple different ways, both through the TED Talk and through your documentary, uh, and through you know possibly other work that we haven't spoken about yet, that you found uh, some different ways to get your message out there and start conversations. I do. I'm very interested in how I can communicate with uh, people who may be interested in learning about social work. You know, when we were in school and we would read um, uh, scholarly articles in in social work journals, and I I was interested in writing for them, but then I would also think, how do you get the message out to someone who wouldn't think to look something up in Mm -hmm. a scholarly journal? How can you communicate with people who might be more inclined just to watch a quick five-minute video on YouTube? And so I thought about it, and I thought, you know, that's really interesting. Um, Maybe make videos, um, you know, speaking as you and Alyssa are on the radio, um, getting your message out in new and different ways. Yep. Well, that's what we always say. Like, we have a, we, we developed a class here to talk to students about this, and it was sort of like the public is client. How do we get our message out to individuals who might never have considered seeing or using a social worker, who don't know what social work is, but they could use the services. They might need to, you know, or could refer someone to the services. So it's really, I mean, I think as a social work profession as a whole, we really need to do things to reach individuals who, you know, have false ideas about what social work is and, you know, don't really know all the benefits and sort of the breadth of work that we do. Absolutely. I agree with that. You, you'll find that there's a common misperception when you're talking to, um, you know, if you just stop someone on the street and you say, you know, what do you think a social worker does? You may hear a response like a, someone who works with a child welfare agency. That's a very typical response. That happened to I me guess. the other day. It was the other day. I was just talking to someone and they were like, oh, you, you, do you, take, you go into the homes and take away kids. I wanted to do social work, but I didn't really know if I could go in to take away the children. And I was like, well, that's really not what social work is. So Exactly. Exactly. There's so much in the profession. I mean, as you know, the social workers who work in the humanitarian 
humanitarian uh, arm of a, an investment bank. There's social workers who work in the armed services. Um, there are social workers, you know, permeating hospitals, nursing homes, schools. So it's not just one thing. And I think the more that we talk about it, it might educate the public more as to what our role, how diverse our roles can be. Yeah, and it's a, it's a critical component, even for not only reaching individuals who might utilize our ser- services, but also reaching individuals who might want to be social workers. I was talking to a group of students uh, who were, are just going to be coming to the university, and I just talked to them about social work, and they said, I never knew about this profession. You know, I was thinking about doing psychology or sociology, but I wanted to help people, and I really didn't know that you could do all of this with social work. Or I wanted to do, like, macro-type work. I wanted to do advocacy and social justice, but I didn't realize that social workers could do that. I thought it was only one-on-one client work. So it's just getting that information out to not only help individuals, but to grow our profession with individuals who might want to be social workers, but just don't know it yet. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the field is, you know, always evolving and rapidly expanding. And there, there are people who could join the social work field who are creative, um, who could lead into a, another direction. And by that, I mean people who may be interested in art and, and film and mm-hmm. writing and um, in becoming an educator, but with a little bit of a different slant. So it's very interesting. So what's, you know, you, you mentioned the next documentary, but what else is uh, down the road for you? What, what do you see as, uh, you know, your sort of next big projects? I think um, my next big projects will be uh, working on the next short film, and I'm very interested in writing a children's book. Um, nice. I like to write articles, and I've been very pleased that some of them have been published, so I'm very excited for that. But I'm really interested in, if I can, um, writing a children's book and talking uh, to children about uh, you know, being who you are, being yourself. I think that would be a great topic, and I think it would be something that would be fun for children and families to read together and, and also also for, uh, you know, social workers who might be interested in working with their younger clients. It's a great idea. It's a great idea. So I'm really excited that you were finally able to come on. And for those who just tuned in, last time uh, Sherry was supposed to be on, we had some technical difficulties, but we did were able to get her back a few weeks later. Um, and we're so glad that you came on today to talk about all of this. But it's such an important... I mean, you hit on a lot of different things. You talked about bullying. You talked about your documentary. But you also really talked about this bigger picture of that we need to get our voice out there. We need to be able to... You know, you found different modes and mediums to get your message out there. And if you had to summarize, as we wrap up, if you had to summarize, you know, what your message is to individuals, like what you're doing, all of this work, these, you know, documentaries and films and um, TED Talks and, you know, possibly a children's book, what is your message to people that you, if you wanted someone to say, like, here's what I do, what's sort of your message? I would say that uh, my message is one of hope, um, one of strength, and trying to um, help people see that they really can turn um, adversity, hardship into something positive and use it as their motivation. So I would say that whatever it is that is um, making you feel, uh, you know, feel passionate about, something that you think about at night before you fall asleep, whatever you feel strongly about, seize that, you know, seize that feeling and move forward with it. Whether you're a social worker, whether you're, um, whether you're a writer, whether you're studying medicine, whatever it is, whatever your passion is, if it's to communicate, if it's to try to do something creative, it's you know to build something that's lasting after you're gone. Um, you know, focus on it and don't let anyone dissuade you. Even if you are encountered by negativity, just. Focus on what you want to do and just move forward with it. Well, you know, that's our message here is uh, to find your voice, share your expertise, do the, use to see the public as client, and that's exactly, you are the perfect example of exactly all the <laughs> stuff that we talk to our students about and we've sort of talked about on the radio show. And uh, I'm so glad we could wrap up our final episode of the season yeah. uh, with you because it really encompassed, you know, our whole point of the of the show and what we want to do. Absolutely. You're, you're the great example for that. For, for well, thank you. It was such a delight to speak with you, and your show is so important, and thank you both for the work that you do. So you've been listening to The Social Workers here on WCDB Albany, and our special guest has been Sherry Saturno, social worker. And uh, Sherry, if folks want to get in touch with you, do you have information, contact information? Um, 
Absolutely. If they would like to get in touch with me, they can find me on LinkedIn okay. after my name or on a website called elderadvocacy.com. Elderadvocacy.com. And the last name is Saturno, S-A-T-U-R-N-O, Sherry Saturno. And I already found her on LinkedIn, so I'm already connected. Great. <laughs> Great. I can't say that I'm LinkedIn myself, so I'll let you guys do that. But uh, <laughs> thank you so much for listening. And also, Sherry, you'll be able to find us. And to those of you who are listening and enjoyed the conversation, with Sherry, you'll be able to hear this conversation again if you'd like to in an archived format that's available on our YouTube. And yeah, uh, I should have that up later today uh, or early tomorrow, but it will always be archived as, as are all our shows for uh, anyone who wants to get the content. So you can find that on our YouTube channel. If you type in the Social Workers Radio Show, you'll find us on YouTube. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Yep, and if you want that, we have a main website on, uh, the. if you go to the School of Social Welfare at the University at Albany, there's also a link to our social workers radio talk show page great thanks for listening and we will see you next semester on the social workers wcdb albany